I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, HDIAC. Today's presentation is entitled, Transforming Traumatic Memories, the Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories, RTM Protocol. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the HDIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on Techopedia within a few days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables HDIAC to conduct these webinars. My pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Richard Gray. Rick is the Research Director for the NLP Research and Recognition Project, where he led the pilot studies of the RTM protocol. He is a past faculty member in the School of Criminal Justice at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Dr. Gray served for more than 20 years in the U.S. Probation Department in Brooklyn, New York. He was the recipient of the 2004 Neurolinguistic Programming World Community Award in Education for his work with federal offenders with substance use disorders. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Gray. Good afternoon, Rick. The floor is now yours. Thanks, Steve. Hello, everybody. I don't know who or how many are there, but welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, the Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories Protocol. It's a novel, non-traumatizing brief therapy for PTSD, uh, characterized by intrusive symptoms. That's the PTSD symptoms, not the protocol. Uh, the protocol itself uh, was rooted in an anecdotal clinical history uh, that we have supported by recent RCTs uh, focused on 20 years of research into reconsolidation. Kareem Nader, uh, who actually uh, was the first author uh, in 2000 at Joe Ledoux's lab to introduce the idea of reconsolidation, uh, has become a strong ally of ours and gets very excited whenever we talk about it. Uh, it's non-traumatizing. Client comfort and safety are crucial. Our mean dropout rate is 10% or lower. Uh, and the reason why, in part, is that we never ask the client to fully confront their trauma. Uh, we always terminate it at the first signs of autonomic arousal. And I think that's a very important part because uh, using reconsolidation, all you need to do is activate the memory. You don't need to confront it. Uh, it's brief. Uh, we have had great success in our studies uh, in just three 60 to 90 minute sessions. Uh, and with that brief intervention span, we've able to get uh, typically upwards of 90% remission. We targeted our research on intrusive symptoms, including nightmares, flashbacks, and sympathetic reactivity. For our studies, we would not allow clients to participate who did not have um, of those intrusive symptoms. And uh, these qualify as severe cases. And you'll see later on when we talk about uh, references and the other research that uh, we were only one of two that met criteria for the treatment of combat-related PTSD in veterans and uh, military service folk. Uh, in a uh, Cochrane-based uh, review of uh, many kinds of interventions. RTM has been tested 
in five RCTs uh, using 160 service-related men and women. Uh, we've obtained loss of diagnosis uh, in more than 90% of those completing treatment. Our ITT results are, are a little less in some studies, but averaging 90%. Uh, this is striking. It's partly because we have targeted the protocol to people with uh, the most intense symptoms. Uh, it successfully treated complex traumas, combat trauma, sexual trauma, MST, childhood sexual abuse, first responder uh, traumas, and other issues. We found that uh, you know treating traumas like unpeeling an, an onion. I think Van der Kolk beat me to that. But uh, as one trauma is resolved, very often another comes up. And I want to make the point that we have been able to deal with multiple levels of deep trauma going all the way back to childhood in almost invariably in three sessions. Uh, we've had some therapists who've uh, needed a few more, but uh, very, very rarely. Uh, so it's treated late onset and continuing PTSD symptoms from the Vietnam and Korean Wars, uh, as well as more recent conflicts, conflicts in the Middle East and South Asia. Now, interestingly, uh, one of the border conditions for uh, uh, reconsolidation has always been the age of the memory that's being treated. What we've found is that, uh, or what we assume, is that in PTSD, it, the active symptoms refresh the memory in a reconsolidated updated, so that even if it's an old Vietnam or Korean era uh, emotional wound, uh, RTM still is effective at the same rate. Uh, we found no difference no matter what the age of the trauma or the time of traumatization. Reconsolidation uh, indicates that uh, memory becomes labelized, subject to change, for a period of one to six hours after its activation. During that period, uh, the memory's importance can be strengthened or weakened, that's its salience, and its emotional tone or content may be changed. Now, We've found, uh, as we've researched the protocol itself, that this maps on to Jack Panskep's idea of a two-factor uh, uh, understanding of emotion, one being valence, whether it feels good or bad, and two being the salience or intensity. Uh, and we found that what we are doing is reducing the salience of the memory. Uh, in RTM, a long-term memory is confronted with information that contradicts some essential element of the memory, but not the entire memory, or provides novel information. These are prediction error, uh, errors, and they are ubiquitous in modern memory research. I first encountered them when studying addictions back in the early aughts uh, in relation to the reprogramming of the nucleus accumbens and the preference hierarchy. But now you'll find that uh, prediction errors appear throughout the brain uh, as a precursor to uh, novel learning. The RTM pipe, how it works. RTM uh, restructures the visual representations of a trauma. Now, that's not to say that it only does it, but primarily we work with visual representations. From time to time, we'll have somebody who's primarily auditory or kinesthetic, and we can work with them as well, as far as that memory is concerned. They may be primarily auditory. But uh, for the most part, this does deal with visual memories, and it's, uh, it restructures it as a past non-threatening memory by changing the structural elements of the memory. We do not change the memory. We believe that's unethical. Uh, but if we change the intensity, uh, things like 
its closeness, its brightness, uh, the presence or absence of color or sound, uh, the speed with which the memory passes, the distance at which it's perceived. Those structural elements are related to the computation of salience as it's computed in the midbrain. Uh, and this is, of course, after the fact research. Um, and um, it renders the memory non-threatening. It may still be sad, uh, reasonably disturbing, as such sad things should be. But it is no longer traumatizing or emergent as something that must be responded to immediately. And the changes, I've, as I just mentioned, include uh, dissociation, the loss of color, the loss of depth cues, increased distance, uh, and other visual and temporal distortions, speed, uh, forwards and backwards. Uh, we make these format changes in a labelization window created by a very brief, non-traumatizing exposure. It is crucial to us and to our patients that they know that they will not be re-traumatized. And so as soon as we see any hesitance, any, any indication of their becoming upset, we stop any narrative uh, that may have been begun, reorient them to the present. Uh, it's the therapist's responsibility to break that state and draw them back into the present. And then we proceed from there. And that dissociated window, uh, the format changes that we make, uh, the changes that we make to the structure of the memory, uh, block the normal reconsolidation of the trauma memory and uh, reduce in the reconstituted memory uh, the intensity of the experience. Reconsolidation allows for fast and robust detraumatization to the memory measured out to one year and surveyed out to five years. Well, it's badly written, I apologize. Uh, but we have measured in um, several of our studies uh, client responses out to a full year uh, formally and have found that among those that we could contact, uh, the changes have held. And uh, they come back with very low non-clinical uh, uh, scores on the PSSI and RTM. And uh, an informal survey of everyone we could find, um, I think it ended up being about 65% uh, of everyone we've treated, uh, found the results have held out to about five years. Um, those were the first 30 subjects five years ago. What we do, four steps, uh, easy peasy. A brief exposure to the traumatic memory opens a window during which the memory becomes susceptible to change. Now, that brief exposure introduces a prediction error uh, where the client normally expects to go out of control, uh, to have their life come crumbling down in the face of the symptoms that they've had for so long. Uh, suddenly, that stopped. Where they're used to having uh, standard therapy uh, and they're encouraged to tell the whole story in the very beginning. And as we go through uh, the early process, we discourage the whole story. We don't want someone to get so upset. Uh, the preclinical research on reconsolidation suggests that if you allow it to proceed too far, you end up either with uh, an extinction memory or re-traumatization. We want neither, we want to rewrite the structure of the memory. Two, the client is guided through repeated versions of a dissociated black and white imaginal movie from the perspective of a dissociated watcher watching themselves sitting in a movie theater as that person in the theater watches the black and white movie of the traumatic event. Boy, is that a mouthful. But this is the basic intervention. The client uh, enters a movie theater. They sit comfortably in the movie theater. On the screen is the first scene in black and white before anything happened when they were still safe. 
It begins with a safe representation. This is a still picture. Find their seat in the movie theater, perhaps one they've been to before, perhaps a completely imaginary movie theater, but nevertheless, a movie theater that creates an aura of um, this isn't quite real. You don't tell them that. Uh, and on the screen, uh, there will be played a black and white movie with structural changes of the trauma event in 30 to 45 seconds. Now, it's important that our client is triply dissociated. There's a dissociation between the client and the movie theater uh, as they watch the movie. Client then dissociates again from their own body and imagines floating into the projection booth. From there, they watch themselves as that self in the theater watches the movie. So that removes them another step away. I lose count how I get to three, but it is three levels of dissociation. So the client is always kept safe. Their job is to monitor the safety of their body down there in the theater who is watching the movie. Three, when they're comfortable, after enough repetitions with enough structural changes, making the movie screen further away, making the image smaller, uh, changing the aspect ratio, turning the screen away, changing where the client's uh, projection booth may be with relation to the screen, changing the speed, uh, all kinds of things, uh, changing the figures into stick figures all kinds of possible structural changes. When they are comfortable with that, they're asked to float down into their body and to check whether or not that body is comfortable. If it is, they're then asked to walk to the front of the theater in, in Imago, uh, and they step into the end of the event. At the time, a place in the event or after the event, actually, where they felt safe that it was over, that they had survived. They may not feel completely safe, but relatively safe as to the event that has just occurred. When they step into that, it's a black and white movie, just like the first one. The lights come on, the colors come on, the sounds come on, and the client re-experiences that event in reverse as a high-speed reversed movie in which they have the experience of everything undoing itself, moving backwards to the safe place before anything happened, which is the image that was originally on the screen when they walked into the movie theater. Now, it's important that the client experience it running backwards. It's crucially important that it be done in the space of about two seconds, very fast, so fast that they can barely get any details. This may be repeated several times until the client is comfortable. Uh, it's usually then followed by a, uh, a SUDS report. Finally, after, after sufficient uh, calming, uh, we require that the client's report of subjective units of distress, SUDS, uh, be three or less before this final stage. The client creates an alternative version of the trauma event that they practice until comfortable. Now, this is a best of all worlds uh, fantasy reliving. And uh, as long as the initial uh, conditions are the same, they are free to uh, imagine anything. We've had uh, combat uh, vets talk about the uh, being called out on a drill, a drill that ended up being uh, with horrible consequences, leaving them traumatized. And instead of taking one path, they take another. Uh, in another case, their orders changed and they go somewhere else. In another case, uh, they were able to fight a, a woman reported being able to fight off her attacker. Uh, all kinds of things, but they must begin at the same place. So. Uh, this past week, I reviewed a uh, trauma narrative where uh, a woman uh, in the Marines 
was attacked in her bedroom. She was asleep. Someone came in the door, which was insufficiently locked, and uh, proceeded to rape her. You know, a horrible story. Um, and so when she created her best of all worlds, uh, she had an effective lock on the door. Uh, she began sleeping. And the guy never came by. He was never able to get in. It didn't happen. And then after successful repetitions of those, we test the original memory. We don't test uh, the uh, imaginal memory or, or the uh, fantasy memory. We test the real memory. Our intention is never to replace the memory, but only to change its salience. Uh, let's go on here. What we do in four steps. Uh, SUDS assessments serve as checks on client progress through the cycles of treatment. We have an initial SUDS, a baseline, uh, after the uh, initial narrative. A second check comes after the first rewind. And then a third check comes after uh, the alternative fantasy version. Now, the black and white movie and the um, rewind uh, are subject to multiple repetitions. All right, most of the work uh, in this process is done by varying the structure of the black and white movie and in having the client experience uh, the event undoing itself and going in reverse. Uh, we find that SUDS assessments can go from uh, 10 down to zero in a matter of one or fewer sessions for any one uh, trauma. Our success criteria, uh, symptom scores must drop below clinical and diagnostic cutoffs. Uh, in our original study, uh, we used the uh, military PTSD cutoff of uh, 50 points, but found that in general our subject uh, fell below the diagnostic uh, criterion on P, uh, PL, uh, 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 the checklist, uh, PTSD checklist, uh, below 30, and uh, did not endorse the necessary three DSM criteria. This is DSM-4. Flashbacks and nightmares related to the events treated ceased. Now, there's an important distinction. People have nightmares. Uh, people normally don't have flashbacks. Uh, if they have other traumas, there could still be flashbacks related to those traumas. But any trauma that we have treated, the flashbacks of nightmares disappear completely. Uh, the event narrative fails to evoke negative sympathetic arousal. We've had people on the last narrative laugh out loud uh, at, at their past inability to understand the meaning of things. We've had people have revelations and say, my goodness, I was just a kid. Uh, one man who was ordered by uh, the CIA while in Vietnam to uh, murder his lover, who it ended up was a double agent, had carried horrible guilt. He couldn't even remember her name. As we went through the process, details were restored. His ease of relating the uh, trauma details increased. Uh, and finally, at the end, he shook his head and he says, well, I was a kid. Uh, his life was restored. His wife was amazed. Uh, and he began to enjoy things that he hadn't enjoyed in years. Uh, the event is recalled easy with, easily with richer details, as I just uh, mentioned. The event is recalled like just another memory. One of the striking things that happens as we treat people is what they discover after typically the rewind that, my goodness, it's, it's so far away. It's just, you know, it's just like another memory. They gain a perspective uh, to use uh, a convenient metaphor. Uh, and it's striking uh, to hear people say that. We look for that. We look for people to say, wow, this is just another memory. There's an aha moment there that happens almost every time without coaching. The event takes on a different significance in the person's life. It is spontaneously reappraised. You know, modern approaches often seek reappraisal uh, 
not only as an outcome, but as a technical, um, a technique for resolving PTSD. What we found that reducing is that reducing the salience by manipulating the structure of the memory, we have people consistently reappraising, reappraising uh, the event and its meaning in their life as a whole spontaneously. Uh, over and over again, you hear people saying, well, you know, it's unfortunate, but it was, it's what I had to do. Uh, another review uh, I recently did of, of a treatment involved a, a man watching a colleague being run over by a train, uh, an accident, but it stayed with him for now five years. And um, he was able to look at it and say, well, you know, number one, it wasn't my fault. And it was a horrible thing, but you know what? Things happen. He was just that polite, just that calm. Uh, and we have that kind of responses. Family members report observed changes. Uh, in one of our early cases, I remember uh, the wife came in and her amazement at uh, how her husband had changed, where their marriage had been falling apart because of his symptoms. Uh, he had become more flexible, more open, more caring and less fearful. Uh, and we find those kinds of things all over. Uh, one of the people I just spoke about, his wife, was so pleased that he returned to building his birdhouses that he hadn't done in years. Previous trauma triggers no longer activate responses. In line with FOA and COSAC's recommendations from so long ago, we prod and poke and uh, have the client retell the trauma story in as much detail as they can and uh, watch carefully. Now, all of our interventions are non-instrumented. We train our clinicians uh, to observe for changes in facial tension and bodily tension, facial color, changes in breathing, lacrimation, any sign that the client is reactive. And we find uh, voice tone. Uh, we find that, that these responses are no longer there. Uh, and the, it's, it's striking to see the physiological change. Uh, our results have stayed ro robust across one year follow-ups in uh, really all, all of the studies. In the first study, we didn't have a true one-year follow-up, but our informal follow-up of about 75 people uh, three years later found that 90% uh, of them uh, were reporting continued success. Uh, here are some dramatic symptom severity reductions. Uh, you'll see the first study is a male study, 30 subjects, completed in 2017. Uh, and we're reporting here only the PSSI study uh, reports. Uh, Ty Lee et al., uh, we have a beginning uh, level. Uh, let me turn to my larger copy because um, I'm uh, pretty blind. 39.75 is the mean PSSI score, dropping to 7.82 at uh, two weeks and to 3.4 at uh, six months. And so it's non-clinical. Uh, and in general, these people do not report the necessary uh, symptom clusters for continuing diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, the second study, Gray et al., 2017, this was a, a much larger study, 64 people, uh, males again. And again, we begin with a very high PTSD score or PSSI score. Uh, it drops to 15.7 uh, uh, at two weeks and at six months at 17.6. That's a non-significant change. Uh, I'll make no excuses. Success is success. These are non-clinical scores uh, with a cutoff of uh, 23, I believe, for PSSI. Uh, 
all of these subjects, again, uh, were non-clinical. The third study is our uh, still in process uh, female study, uh, 30 subjects, 22 of whom suffered some kind of sexual trauma, uh, many of whom had multiple traumas. And you'll see that measurements uh, of PSSI uh, vary insignificantly across time, up to a full year. And uh, in the male study, it's not reported here. We also had results uh, tie Lee et al. out to a year. So uh, this is very robust. The results last. Uh, we believe that's fundamentally a property of the intervention. Uh, we think that even a ham-handed therapist, although we're careful not to create such, uh, can get similar results. Uh, here on the next slide, let me move that open for you. Uh, we have a comparison of RTM results with the uh, CPT, uh, PE, and uh, well, cognitive processing therapy present centered therapy and uh, prolonged exposure, mass prolonged exposure and uh, standard prolonged exposure. And you'll see very plainly that, first of all, our dropout rate never rises uh, above 12 percent, OK? Um, again, no excuses there. Our average is about 10 percent. Uh, the yellow bars indicate RTM scores. Uh, they are not ITT. Uh, the PSSI scores in blue uh, represent for our studies uh, ITT scores, 90% uh, loss of diagnosis and uh, very striking uh, number. Uh, you'll see that, that uh, for the rest, the comparisons uh, for any other treatment rise as high as 49% for PE and 40% for remission uh, in any of the other studies. We have our understandings of why this may be so, but I think this chart is very impressive. I'm not sure you need to look at the RTM uh, scores at the top, uh, but only at the comparisons. Now, some of these studies uh, used CAPS rather than the PSSI, uh, just to be completely transparent. But as you know, PSSI and CAPS are about 98% equivalent. So uh, we feel confident in comparing those two measures. On the next slide, uh, our first study. Uh, was sponsored by New York State with a $300,000 grant. 30 person RCT, barely we had a five person comparison group. So largely we cite this as a pre post study. But the mean intake score was 61 uh, with a reduction of 44.7 uh, points. Uh, that's a massive reduction. It far outstrips uh, gratis at all's. Uh, standard for clinical change on PCLM of 20 points. It doubles it, certainly. Uh, and the mean PCLM score at the end was 28.8, uh, which is below the 30-point uh, cutoff for any PTSD. At six weeks, the Hedges G was 2.9 standard deviations, uh, which I think is uh, pretty good. However, our other studies do a little better. Uh, again, the first replication study was 30 males. 94% of all 30 males uh, were symptom-free at all follow-ups to one per to one year post. Mean reduction, 39.8 points on PCLM. Uh, Hedges G, 3.59. Uh, that's a huge uh, effect size. Of course, Compared to nothing, you can get, and in a small study, you can get large effect sizes, but typically not this large and not as consistently. Our experimental comparison, weightlessness controls at six weeks versus RTM group at two weeks post. 
So we have the wait list who've been waiting for six weeks before they get any treatment. They're retested at the end of six weeks, and they're compared with the RTM group two weeks post-treatment. Hedges G there is 3.66 standard deviations. 12-point mean PCLM scores for the treatment completers with 81.5 or some reporting were 20.9, a reduction of 46.5 points. Again, twice uh, Gravis et al.'s standard for clinically significant changes. Uh, let's see, I think I've <laughs> failed to move the slides. The second replication, 30 females uh, now submitted. 96% of the 30 women were symptom and diagnosis free at all follow ups to one year. Despite extensive histories of complex PTSD with MST rapes and repeated childhood trauma, this was a severely traumatized population. And uh, the results are stellar, I don't need to say. Mean symptom score reduction, 43 points on PCI, and 34 points on PSSI. All right, uh, the mean <laughs> PSSI score at the end was 7.172, uh, plus or minus uh, 9, gets them up to 16, still below the clinical threshold for any uh, PTSD. Uh, the experimental comparison, again, uh, six weeks versus two weeks experimental, PSSI mean 9.667. Uh, all of these were highly significant in the paper we recently submitted uh, reporting this study. The uh, actual probabilities went out to five decimal places. The effect size, again, for this uh, uh, result, hedges G, <laughs> three standard deviations. Third replication study, of uh, 64 person study, has similar results. 90% of the 64 male veterans scored below diagnostic threshold at two weeks, six weeks, and six months. Our primary measure was the PSSI. The mean symptom score uh, had reductions of 23 points at six months. Uh, intake score, 38.5. Final mean scores at six months, 15.38. The experimental control uh, comparison, like the others, highly significant. Now, one of the more striking the studies that we are trying to get published right now is a study that paired uh, RTM treatment. Let me just change the page. That changed uh, RTM treatment, tested RTM treatment uh, against a population of neurotypical people. It was a database. And um, what we did was we uh, replicated uh, the study with QEEG results, pre and post. And the most striking part about this study is that after treatment with uh, RTM, EEG results failed to show what our uh, lead author has identified as a footprint of PTSD. And you'll see on the next page that uh, here's a sample of three subjects. And you'll see that in the first row on the far right, or rather in the first uh, batch, on the far right column, column five, there are those red blotches in the left uh, temporal and occipital lobes, uh, parietal lobes. Uh, and uh, in the bottom subject, in the left temporal and uh, lateral prefrontal cortex. If you shift over to the second batch of results, you'll see that uh, those high activation areas are no longer there. And indeed, those people ended up uh, with no further PTSD symptoms 
like our other subjects. Uh, this was a study that included uh, 27 subjects compared against 30 neurotypicals. And um, this is a very striking study. A lot of people take a look at these results, uh, in particular these visualized results, and uh, say, well, there's, there is something there. Going on, um, past our result, we've started some training initiatives. Uh, since last year, we've uh, been we've provided training for more than 150 service providers from VA centers and private organizations. Uh, a review of those trainings work with RTM finds they get the same results that we do after four days of training and coaching on their first three clients. All right, those are, are two things. There's a four-day uh, in-person training, and then we ask them to present uh, three complete RTM treatments on three different people. And we coach them through that, so number one, to ensure they're getting it right, and number two, uh, to make sure of quality control so that when they get done, they are getting the same results. The evaluations of all our trainings to date have rated the training and the clinical effectiveness of the RTM protocol at 9.5 or above on a 10-point scale. We are very excited about this. We have uh, trainings for up to 1,000 people scheduled for the next two years. We've just completed one in uh, New York City and have others scheduled. Uh, next slide, under a two-year study. Oh, pending research, yes. Uh, we received a grant from the, from the Center for Neuroscience Regenerative Medicine at the Uniform Services University at Walter Reed. Uh, they actually received the grant. I am co-investigator there with Dr. Michael Roy, head of internal medicine, uh, and he is the lead author. This is comparing uh, brief PE, 10 sessions of prolonged exposure, uh, with RTM for up to 10 sessions, which we don't think anyone will ever need, in a population of moderate uh, traumatic brain injury patients. The literature indicates that uh, TBI symptoms are exacerbated by PTSD, and uh, we are predicting in part that uh, RTM will resolve PTSD for the great majority of these patients, and in the process will help to resolve some of the symptoms uh, of their P, uh, TBI. Um, the other study, King's College London, uh, funded by the government forces uh, Mind and Trust. Uh, we've got a randomized trial. Unfortunately, I don't have at the tip of my tongue uh, the number of subjects, but we are comparing it against uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral interventions unspecified. That's now underway in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, here are some selected references. Oh, we seem to be missing a slide. One minute. Uh, ah, well. Okay, let me just make one point on the references. If you can read them, you will see Kitchener, Lewis, Roberts, and Bisson, 2019 active duty and ex-service military personnel with post-traumatic stress disorder treated with psychological therapies, systematic review. This was a Cochrane-based review, uh, and it found that examining EMDR, PE, uh, in its multiple varieties, PCT, uh, whatever alphabet you come up with, there were only two studies that met their criterion of uh, having an effect size of 0.8 or greater, and RTM was one of them. Although we've been characterized as a um, an intervention still in need 
an emerging uh, intervention in need of further research. Uh, this is a striking conclusion that of all the treatments uh, available for military PTSD, uh, only ours and group uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy was effective. And there's our contact information again. I'll open this up for questions if you have any, uh, and I'll be happy to attempt to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks for that presentation, Rick. The uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting topic um, work that you're that you're uh, doing there. So, yeah, if anybody, if any of our uh, folks on the line have any questions uh, for Rick, uh, you, you can submit them via chat, and we'll uh, we'll uh, bounce them off bounce them off Rick. But so uh, I once once again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just amazed by the results that you're getting. You know, I, it just seems that these, um, you know, most most studies don't don't have, uh, you know, numbers like this. You know, a, like a dropout rate of ten percent. You know, ninety percent success rate in three sessions or so. I, I mean, it just seems, you, you know, <laughs> do you have any? It's hard do you have to any? I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you and have any? I, that's been a problem for us because you know, you submit something to a journal, and they say, "Oh, baloney! This can't be right." <laughs> and uh, well, finally, we've had the Cochrane reviews, and they've gone over our studies with a uh, fine-tooth comb. And even though the studies are far from perfect, they met their criteria, and so we're getting some. Uh, <laughs> support and now we have two comparison studies running, which is what we really needed, and they are independent of us. My involvement in the CRNM study at Walter Reed uh, has extended to training and uh, following up for uh, treatment compliance. Uh, all the rest is being handled uh, by other people. I'm blind to everything going on except for the the. Uh, patients that I review to ensure compliance. Uh, same with Belfast. Uh, our people are fundamentally not involved in the study. Uh, I'll be reviewing uh, some of the treatments for compliance. But other than that, these are independent studies comparing it to other places. So uh, you will no longer have to just believe us. There will be other people that uh, you can either believe or disbelieve. Okay. Yeah. No. That's 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 good. That you know, other folks are, you know, doing the comparison and 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 confirming, you know. So I, I just think that that's, uh, you know, I just think it's, you know, amazing. The, the re you know, the results are just amazing. So that's that's fantastic. So, well, I, 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 you know, I, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no. 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 Go ahead. I just want to say. From time to time, they need me to actually do the treatments. Uh, in some of the studies, I was I was one of the uh, providers, and uh, you have these these guys come in. And I only work with men, but it does work with women. And uh, some of them just can't bear to tell the story. Some of them they tense up, and you see these physiological responses. That are undeniable. You know, if you knew nothing about psychology, you would know that these people are feeling it. And you stop that, and you go through the protocol, and uh, you know, you go through this non-intuitive set of instructions. And at the end, some of them leave laughing and joking about it. Others are just amazed and open-faced, and they come back the next time and they say, "What'd you do to me?" <laughs> and we always respond, well, we didn't do anything. You did all the work. All we did was provide some directions for you to heal yourself. And uh, that's exactly what happens, is that these are capacities that we all have, but we don't know how to use. And they're often easier to use when someone guides you through them. Yeah, I think the, yeah, I mean, and like like you're saying, I mean, when somebody is kind of, um, you know, reliving that memory, I mean, it's, it's you know, they're going through the same kind of emotional 
situation, you know, the same emotional feelings that they had during the the initial event. And and there's some, you know, somehow in this process, you're being able to, um, you know, detach the emotion from, you know, from that situation where they can then become this kind of uh, objective observer and, and, and view it, but not have the same feeling, you know, uh, any attached to it any longer. And I, I just, you know, it's just kind of a <laughs> miraculous, it seems. It, 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 it seems nearly miraculous, even to me when I do it. But, you know, it, it, it is that we don't understand that we can literally turn down the intensity of of a memory using the kinds of physiological checks that the body itself uses. My cat just came to visit. Um, and and uh, there's there's a body of evidence that points to, oh, VO is one author, white is another, uh, that points to the uh, superior colliculus. And uh, there are retina topic maps uh, there that map specifically for things like uh, overlap, for color, for brightness. And these moderate the salience of any memory, positive or negative. And when we adjust the brightness, the distance, uh, the speed of it, uh, when we introduce prediction error, error, that changes the way the brain understands how important this memory is now. And it's a, a very, very striking. That's our hypothesis about how it works. Again, the reconsolidation piece is basically an hypothesis that we work on. Uh, but using that hypothesis, we've had pretty good results. And, and so does that, you, you talked about earlier, you know, with the, you know, having them imagine viewing a black and white movie. Is this, so is that part of that, that uh, re reducing the salience there, the taking the color out and starting with a, you know. Out, making it smaller, changing the speed. Oh. And and okay. if, if, if you consider uh, FOA has said uh, for years that one one of the important things that happens with PTSD, Edna FOA, that is from UPenn, um, is, is that people have a sense of loss of control. And that sense of loss of control spreads to much of their life beyond uh, the PTSD symptoms themselves. Well, what we do is we have the client change the brightness. We have them change the color, the distance, uh, change the way the movement flows. Uh, and they learn there, uh, even if it isn't made explicit, that they have control over the way they see and understand things. Some naturally take it and begin to use it in other parts of their lives. Others just walk away thankful for the change that they've received. But part of that, I think, is is this uh, self-efficacy piece that they gain uh, while manipulating the intensity of their own memories. Yeah, that they're that they're the ones that that can control those variables, and and then that helps control their reaction to the to that situation, or or like you said, they can transfer it to other situations and, and utilize it in in other areas as well. So that's that's incredible. One of our one of our clients was a uh, caught in the earthquake in uh, Alaska and was 62 or 64, and uh, his trauma was watching children falling into these chasms and being helpless to do anything, and uh, he was cleared uh, completely of any symptoms, and he reported that that you know there are other things that sometimes bother him that never rise even to the level of PTSD. And he uses the same kinds of things, making it further away, uh, smaller, speeding it up. Uh, and it changes things. I, I, was, uh, I had a cousin who was deeply disturbed by uh, his alcoholic sister. Uh, and um, we were talking about it one day, and you know, his upsetment was palpable. And I, there was a, a barn just at the other side of his property line. I said, project it on that barn in black and white and leave it there. 
And, you know, he was able to deal objectively with his sister from that point on. Because whenever he thought about her, he thought about her projected on the bong in black and white. Now, for PTSD, obviously, you need more than just that simple uh, of, uh, intervention. Uh, but that is the kind of simplicity with which these things proceed. And uh, so we, we do have a question from, from one of our attendees. Uh, Wondering uh, how someone, um, you know, might be able to get access to to the treatment. How is there? How, how would how would somebody go about, you know, trying to take advantage, uh, participate in this in your in in the RTM protocol? In, oh, okay. Uh, they would contact Frank Burke, and if you see on that last slide, uh, there is his email address. Uh, and so if you contact Frank, he can get you in touch with a, uh, a treatment provider or get you training if you're interested. Okay, that's, that's great. Appreciate, we appreciate that. Um, so just so kind of curious, like the, the, the foundations for this. Uh, so it, does this have like anything is is this based on neuro linguistic programming is that is it an nlp type of intervention is there a, a you know connection the, the there original, yeah the, the source was an nlp phobia cure <clears throat> that was uh rejiggered a little by steve and connie ray andreas in the 80s and they began working with ptsd and had the same kind of results that we have Frank Burke began to apply that same intervention to victims of uh, the 9-11 disaster in downtown Manhattan and got extraordinary results. Well, he said, this is so good. We've got to uh, uh, do some research and see if we can get it funded and get it out there to help people. Uh, he and I got together and I said, the first thing we have to do is we have to find a mechanism. I'm a great believer in Wilson's idea of um, oh, what's what, what's the word? Consilience. That data has to line up on every level of integration, uh, physiological on down. And we discovered that the growing literature of reconsolidation was a really good match for this. And so what we did is we structured the protocol uh, so that it was more closely in accordance with the physiology of reconsolidation and standardized it so it could be researched. And so we came up with the RTM, which is uh, quite a bit removed from its source in the fast phobia cure, uh, but still we acknowledge that route. Okay. And, you know? and Go ahead, I'm sorry. And like, and like you were saying, and I believe in your presentation, you were saying that you've you know, you've developed the protocol, but now you've been training other people to to use the protocol, and they're they're also getting you know the same results. So it's it's just not the core of folks that developed it. You know, you're be, you're able to teach others how to use it, and and they can apply it, and they're and they're getting uh, similar results. Is that is that correct? Yes. By now, we have a cadre of probably 200 people across the nation who've had the four-day training and have passed our certification protocol. And uh, if they have our certification, that means we've done quality control. control uh, and we know that they're getting the same kinds of results. Uh, we require them to follow our protocol closely. Uh, it is scripted. And uh, if they follow the script, they get the same results. That's, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, because it just it just seems that there's you know you, you know a lot of folks uh, that can benefit from this. Obviously, you know a number you know military folks that have you know oh. had had incidents where they've you know suffered tr suffered traumas. But you know there's a lot of folks in the general population that have other you know events that they've experienced, and uh, you know I'm sure they can benefit from this too. So uh, the, you know more. One of our um, one of our recent trainings was for a group of uh, therapists and psychologists 
who work with prison guards in the New York state system. And uh, so they are going out to deliver it uh, to prison guards uh, who have suffered PTSD from their interactions in the prison system. My hope is that at some point they will also offer it to the prisoners uh, who are likely to have suffered much more PTSD than the guards themselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I would imagine both 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 of those populations could benefit from the uh, from the treatment. <laughs> and and you know, as a first responders, uh, we've had success treating first responders, but we haven't reported those in our studies because uh, at this point it's only anecdotal. We don't have enough to, as a study. But um, in our in our study of military folk and veterans. Uh, very often there are first responder traumas. Uh, one woman that we treated uh, had been picking up bodies after a plane crash, uh, something that first responders encounter all the time. Uh, other people report accidents. Uh, in the recent female study, uh, recently reported, uh, it was finished in 2017, uh, what, 22 uh, of the women there had suffered rapes uh, and serious military sexual trauma. Some of them had multiple rapes. We've treated multiple instances of childhood sexual abuse uh, and physical abuse as well, uh, and with the same kinds of results. So uh, this is a robust protocol, and uh, with very little training, someone can go out and do well with it. Uh, by the way, for our trainings, we generally require some kind of professional license. Uh, we aren't ready yet to give it out uh, to everybody and anybody that would like to do it. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, it's in the hands of professionals uh, who are competent to uh, deal with anything that might arise. Sounds sounds good. Sounds like a good approach. So, does uh, does anybody uh, have any other any any other questions for Rick? Uh, we're uh, I think we're kind of getting near the our time. Um, so Rick, any any last uh, you know any last comments? Any anything you'd like to to add as we uh, wrap wrap up here? Well, uh, I w I would say uh, I think my contact information is on the first slide. And uh, if anyone would, would like to contact me, please feel free. Let me see, without making everybody dizzy, if that is there. Uh, if it's not, I will give it to you. Uh, contact Frank for uh, teaching uh, and treatment. Yeah, and there's my information. I'm best for answering questions and providing copies of uh, our studies and of the background studies. If you have questions about mechanism uh, and the background itself, you should contact me. If you're interested in training or treatment, contact Frank Burke. And I put that first slide up so you have both of our emails. Great. Yes, and we'll get and then we'll be posting we'll be posting the uh, slides and the presentation on Techopedia, so they'll they'll be there. If folks have any questions after the fact, you can always um, uh, reach out to us at uh, info at hdiac.org. Uh, if you have any questions, you know you can just uh, you know shoot your shoot your question there, and and uh, one of our our staff will will. You know, get back to you and respond to your inquiry. And um, once again, Frank, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to share the information. Uh, you know, I'm just uh, really blown away by you know the uh, you know the results that uh, that you're getting. And uh, you know, I think it's fantastic. And you know, I want to wish you continued success in your research and, and you know, in getting this method spread out there. I think it. Um, I think it can help a lot of people. I think a lot of folks would benefit from that. So I just want to, you know, wish you, uh, you know, the best, you know, the best in your future endeavors in, in advancing this uh, this activity. Thanks, Steve, and thank you all for coming and uh, enduring my uh, 
uh, hobbled uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you learned something. And please feel free to contact me if you have further questions. And uh, Frank, if you would like treatment, if you uh, would rather just contact me, I can pass on your information to Frank. And uh, he'll get you in touch with someone uh, you, who can treat you. Also, you might want to contact uh, us through the website. Let me just give you that. That is randrproject.com. Very simple. It looks like randrproject.com. We have nothing to do with a rand. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Rick, and thanks, folks, for attending. And uh, we'll uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you at our uh, at our uh, webinar next month. And uh, have a have a great day. And we'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye bye now. Bye bye.